welcome into the conversation on Sky Sport, where this week we are delving into the state of the game, the women's game, women's rugby, that is, as we build up to an historic occasion, the first ever Super Rugby Wahine women's match between the Blues and the Chiefs at Eden Park on May 1st. We're going to talk to some ex-players, we're going to talk to some current players over the course of the series, and we're also going to go straight to the top with some of the leading administrators in the game. And when I say straight to the top, well, why not? Let's welcome in Katie Sanders. Sadly, a general manager, women's rugby for World Rugby. Slumming it down in Queenstown at the moment, uh, Katie, <laughs> but, but welcome. Um, I guess, first of all, from a, a local perspective, the Super Rugby match, uh, what do you make of this happening and, and the steps taken here in New Zealand? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, I mean, New Zealand clearly has had a very special place over the COVID um, pandemic because they have been able to keep playing. Um, but, you know, I had, I had the opportunity over the weekend to catch up with some of the, the key women around the, the, the country and the, everyone is very excited about this, the, the, the new event starting. From a World Rugby perspective, do you have much uh, say or, or involvement in some of the clubs and, and competitions around the globe for the women's game? Not so much the clubs, but we work really closely. You know, we, we pull together the the kind of the performance directors slash the heads of women's rugby from most of the major unions on a fairly regular basis to share, compare and transfer knowledge about what's going on. And I guess a really good example of that was the launch earlier this year of WXV. So that was done by pulling in the likes of the Kate Sextons and the Jilly Coopers and the Emily, the Emily Bidewells and the Nikki Ponsfords to actually talk about what's happening locally. How do we actually get a global calendar together that works from a, a, a local perspective, a, a regional perspective and a global perspective to make the most of developing women's rugby? Women, women's XV was announced recently. That is so exciting. I think every woman involved in the game was super pumped. Can you explain a little bit about how it, it's going to work when that competition gets up and running? Yeah, it is it's absolutely a game changer. I mean, I know when I started almost five years ago at World Rugby, you know, we're, we're very, very proud of our seven series. And we, we, you know, obviously are really excited about the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand next year. But we had this gap in our international global calendar for the 15s development. And so we sat down and we worked out, well, well what's possible and came up with a, a concept of agreeing um, two windows that everyone would, would agree to globally. So we now have a regional window which finishes by the end of June. And then we have a new global window where WXV will take place. Initially, it was to kick off in, in 2022, but because of the transfer and the postponement of the World Cup, it will now start in 2023. It's a three-tiered competition, which will happen on an annual basis, except for the year of the Rugby World Cup. Um, six, uh, two tiers of six and one tier of four. Uh, access to the global competition will be through the regional window and the regional competitions and there's a special dynamic associated with a new event that we've also created um, which impacts on New Zealand uh, to try and and make sure that you know the Six Nations is an incredibly strong competition that happens every year there was nothing really for the rest of the world so we put in place a new competition which is actually starting this year which involves New Zealand Australia Canada and the USA on a regular basis. Well, that competition will happen in the in the regional window, and the top three teams from that competition um, will go through to tier one of the new global competition. So a really strong um, top three from Six Nations, top three from our new uh, Trans uh, Oceania and um, Americas competition, uh, and then another tier and another tier which have got relegation and promotion. So and that takes place over a seven-week period. Yeah, so, so it's meaningful, regular test matches which these nations Absolutely. can plan and, and, I guess, figure out how to finance and, and all of that over a course of a few years. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the majority of the finance in terms of the event is actually covered by World Rugby. We've committed um, $6.4 million for the first two years, so it's a $3.2 million investment per year to cover the costs of the actual tournament. Um, clearly, that doesn't, that doesn't cover the preparation costs of the teams that happen, happen locally. But you're quite right. What it does do now is provide a framework for which people can plan World Cup to World Cup where they know that they will have access to a high level of competition. And it means that, you know, for some countries going into the World Cup, like maybe I would use Australia as an example, in the last World Cup lead into 217, they had had barely, with the exception of competing against the Black Ferns, they had had very little competition. Now they will have a new global competition that happens every year with the best of the best competing against each other. Mm. But you're also right. It definitely is about driving the regional growth, the global growth. I mean, we're looking at expanding the Rugby World Cup um, for the next edition after after the New Zealand one to 
another four teams. So we really have to concentrate on building those competitive pathways in the 15s program so we can grow the game. Yeah, I was going to ask that, Katie. How do you ensure that, just like in the men's game, I guess, that the rich don't get richer? We know that England, France and New Zealand in particular, probably the three strongest women's playing nations. Yeah. We down here obviously want to see the Pacific teams get some opportunities, the Asian nations as well. So how do you ensure that, yeah, as I say, the rich don't just get richer and, and leave the rest okay. behind? Yeah, I mean, and that was that was a kind of a clear direction that, you know, I was given when I started working at World Rugby was that we wanted to make sure that our pinnacle events, that we, we that we close the gaps and margins between the top teams in the competition and the bottom. We, we wanted to make sure that, you know, over time that that pinnacle world event, whether it's the sevens or the 15s, is that it, that, you know, the majority of the people could finish and it could get through to the quarterfinal. So this this year, you know, we, we sort of started in a kind of a small um, capacity uh, last year, but with the postponement of the World Cup um, through to next year, one of the, one of the outcomes of that was a commitment from World Rugby to invest in a decent, financed, high performance program for the women's game. And we are sitting down, just trying to work through how that how that manifests itself. But at this stage, we've committed an, an additional minimum of two million pounds to start working on the campaign programs for the teams leading into um, the New Zealand Rugby World Cup. And then that's the start of how do we actually make sure that we're working with those performance directors, that we're, we're building that talent and that we're really driving an improvement in the competitive pathways for women's mm -hmm. rugby. So the money side of it is always a big deal. As you said, world rugby investment. What about outside commercial and sponsor? How can we commercialise the women's game more and pump some, pump some funds in? Yeah, yeah. We, um, you know, that we're we're at the halfway mark. I mean, I've, like I said earlier, I, I guess I've been in in this role for almost five years. Um, I was appointed in September 2016, but I didn't move to Ireland until January 2017. Um, we developed a global strategy, which was an eight-year strategy, and it had five pillars: one which was about participation, another about performance, another about leadership, which we've done some. Well, maybe we'll have some time to talk about the great changes we've made there. Another about profile, and the fourth was about creating a diversified investment stream. You know, if if one of the the challenges was yes to get more money from within World Rugby targeted towards the women game, but to expand the pie as well. So around the time of um, the Rugby World Cup in Japan, a decision was made to unbundle the commercial rights for women's rugby and men's rugby. Up until then, when you looked at the World Cups, if you were a, a top sponsor for the, the men's World Cup, you also had thrown into that package that you had the rights for women and potentially maybe under 20s. A call was made to say that, no, it's time for women's rugby. It has real value on its own, that we want to have commercial partners that absolutely value and see the opportunity for being involved in women's rugby. So we developed a separate commercial strategy and went to market post-World Cup just before the COVID. So that had, that's been slightly challenging. <laughs> slightly. But, you know, we, we're looking for, we're currently looking for six global partners of women in rugby. We've created that new brand linked to world rugby. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really excited to say that, you know, just watch the space. We're almost at the stage where we're about to announce our first global partner. And so that hopefully will start a, a huge different look and feel. And and I guess what we, we are hoping at a global level is that in, in coming up with a separate commercial strategy, we certainly had a look at what was happening in some of the top unions. And we know that we have to help with some of the capability in this area for some of the, 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 the mm -hmm. other unions. So the learnings that we're, we're, that we're get, gaining really quickly, we will share and make sure that we can help regions and unions also capitalise on a separate commercial strategy. Well, if you want to give us the exclusive now and just tell us who your new global partner is, that'd be great. <laughs> nope, I'm not. <laughs> oh, well, I thought, I thought it was. I mean, as you no, say... No, no, no. <laughs> Call me, ask me back. Ask me back in a few weeks. Excellent. We'll, will do, <laughs> will do. Um, you see, you've been in the role, as you say, about five years. Um, where has the attitudes changed that you have seen? Have you, like, banged heads again Against brick walls basically oh hey sometimes you have to bang heads sometimes you have people pulling you pulling you forward I mean I think what I've been really impressed with is how quickly world rugby has embraced what is good practice in terms of governance reform um, in terms of commitment to leadership development and you know I, I have this this term um, I call man ambassadors I mean you can't do it on your own you actually need to work with the wider governance review, governance leaders to actually drive and drive that change. And there's been some pretty impressive people. I mean, Sir Bill Beaumont is absolutely committed to the change in terms of um, governance reform. He was the one that led the, the change to adding 17 women directors onto council in the first year that I was there. I mean, that was radically different. You know, we now have a governance um, reform that came up with 
a review that came up with a recommendation, um, an interim recommendation that they want to move towards 40% of women on all committees and subcommittees. So that's really exciting. And the, and the other thing that, they, that we did um, you know, with support from people that the woman, there is a woman's advisory committee. It's chaired by a very passionate French, French man called Serge Simon, who um, calls himself a feminist. And he works very closely with me, um, unlocking buckets of money around the place <laughs> to drive um, what I call a pipeline program. We've now invested in um, almost 50 or well, 49 women around the world who are kind of just at that point where they're, they're either uh, providing senior leadership in a union level, but want to step up into a global level, um, or are you know looking to become presidents, etc. And and that's really exciting. So you know there is there are a lot of people globally that are really committed to maximizing the opportunity that presents itself. Women's rugby is constantly stated by the chief executive, you know, past Brett, now Alan, as the strategic growth area for the game globally. And um, there's a team of people that work with me to make sure that happens. Mm. Obviously, Rugby World Cup, you've mentioned that uh, due to have been in September, has been postponed a year. Right decision, in your opinion? Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. At the time, it was really, really hard. And, 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 and clearly, you know, there's nothing worse when you've been training for the last three years and all of a sudden that gets taken away from you and the goalpost gets moved. And, and I know that a lot of people have had to make decisions. But, but the reality was it was, inc it was proving incredibly challenging, particularly in the qualification processes. I mean, we still have three teams to qualify for the World Cup. And you know, you, you're getting to the stage where or were we going to have to simply just use rankings and not, not let people play on the field? So that's kind of opened up the opportunity to make sure that that proper qualification process is in place. Um, and, and, the, and the world, I mean, it's a challenging time right now. So, you know, we are absolutely committed to making sure that this is the best ever World Cup. Um, you know, it was going to be really hard. I mean, the number of fans and friends and family that were all up desperately to come down to New Zealand. And we're not going to be able to do so because of, of the challenges that presented both the New Zealand government, World Rugby and New Zealand Rugby to pull it off. So there's been some real wins, though, as a result of that. So it's really kind of sad. One was the investment, additional investment we put into the women's game. The other, you know, is that it's given us more time to to rethink um, some of the, the programs that we have put in place. For example, we established a, a program last year called the Coach Internship Program, or SIPS, where we've worked with uh, all the unions that qualify for the World Cup to identify a, a woman coach on the pathway with a vision to being um, a, a, a head coach at an international level. And it's given us more time to work with them. Those coaches are embedded in the program. In New Zealand, that coach is identified was Whitney Hansen, so, you know, a really great coach. Um, so more time for those coaches to work with the coaching team and get experience before they hit the World Cup. Um, and, and also more time to, to really think creatively about how we connect the world with New Zealand and New Zealand with the world in terms of unions uh, that won't be participating, but where we want young girls and, um, and young boys to be inspired what they see on the field here. Well, you've got to find COVID silver lining somewhere. Katie, before I let you go, I'm going to put you on the spot and make you give a pick for our Super Rugby Wahine game, <laughs> Blues Chiefs. And I think you're South Island, you're South Island based generally. If you're, when you're in New Zealand, are you not? You don't have an yeah, affiliation yeah. I'm either a hurricanes way. Hurricanes lady. Oh, you're a Hurricanes <laughs> oh, lady. Yeah. By the way, I mean, I have. A, I'm a Hurricanes lady, but I, you know, I mean, I, you know, there's a. We we obviously had Stacey Walker as one of our first unstoppables yeah. from the Waikato. So you know I'll I'll um, I'll lean towards the Chiefs, but they're both great teams. Oh, there we go. We'll go with the Chiefs. Katie, thank you so much for the energy and enthusiasm and everything you are bringing to the women's game. There are so many good things ahead, and thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. Right, we've heard about where things are at on the global level for women's rugby. Let's take it back to the local level. And New Zealand Rugby's Head of Women's Development is Kate Sexton. Kate, welcome in and thanks for joining us. Um, this Super Rugby women's game, Wahine game, Blues Chiefs, how big of a deal is this for you and your team and, and women's rugby in New Zealand? Well, it's certainly a great step forward um, in part of our high-performance um, development opportunities for players and, and great that the Chiefs and Blues have picked us up and um, worked with us to, to make it happen. So really excited about the opportunity for the players, for those involved um, and, and for where we we're taking the game um, in the performance space. Yeah, how, how did it come about? How did you get to this point? How long, is, how long has it been in the pipeline? Well, we've been talking to them for a couple of years and some of the other super clubs. Um, obviously, last year, 
things were derailed slightly and, slightly. and there was an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being positive here. <laughs> um, so, and there was an opportunity to allow, um, you know, our, our Black Fern squad members to be, be part of this game. And, and so it's just worked um, in the Blues and Chiefs' favour that the timing of this has worked really well for them and, and, and we've collaborated with them and, um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Did, did you have a challenge at all to get the franchises behind it or have, obviously, the Blues and Chiefs in this case and hopefully the others, have they all been really supportive of, of where you're trying to go? Absolutely. Um, you know, we've talked to them in the past about uh, an opportunity uh, for another competition within our domestic um, calendar. And with the, um, the announcement by World Rugby about the World 15s uh, global competition, it's certainly fast-tracked that. So, yeah, they've been really positive. They've been really proactive in that space. So, um, yeah, really pleasing. Well, obviously, the inevitable question, and they've already come, is this can't just be the start. What happens here? Are we going to get a, a women's super rugby full-time competition at some point? Uh, we're absolutely working towards another domestic competition, which would be in a, in a semi-professional space. Um, as I said, with the new global calendar, we are looking for another um, a playing opportunity for the players to put their hand up to be selected for the national team uh, with the regional world um, competition in May, June and, and then the global in the October window. We have our Farah Palmer Cup, um, but we, we're needing another one at the front end of the year. So we're certainly looking at a 14 comp um, in March to be played, very short, sharp competition, but um, a, a semi-professional competition um, from next year can make that work. Cool. Four-team competition, five Super Rugby franchises, that's going to make it tricky. How have you sort of started to think through how that works? Um, we would like three three teams in from the North Island and, and one from the South. So we, we are um, engaging with our super clubs um, and, and how we can work um, with them as them to manage the competition. But that's a work in progress. Ideally, um, our timeline is to be able to announce something more concrete by the start of July, which will um, inform the players and the, and the management staff of the Farah Palmer Cup. So from that, we would like to, our desire is to select our top at least 110 athletes from that competition that would feed into these four teams. Um, if they're available to play. Yeah, So, because I guess that's the feeling, right, that at the moment the gap between Farah Palmer Cup and international rugby is too big and, and there's not enough for those top-tier level players at the moment. Yeah, it's a step that we've been looking forward uh, to having um, within that uh, competition space. I think, um, you know, just talking to some of the Black Ferns in camp over the weekend, the excitement around the Chiefs Blues match this the start of May, um, I think this will be a, a great progression. Um, there's still a little bit of work to do behind the scenes, uh, obviously, but um, huge opportunity, not just for the playing and management group, but just just the alignment um, and collaboration within the, the Super Club regions, um, how we can continue to allow women to thrive within in women's rugby. Because you said, Kate, about if those players are available, those 110 that you'd like from, from FPC to go into this comp, because there is that issue that the women's players, they are some, some are semi-professional, holding down jobs. They've got big campaigns ahead with the World Cup. How do you look to manage that? Does it need a big, a big cash injection, basically, to pay them all? <laughs> well, certainly we're looking at... Um, they would, in the new competition, we're looking at not a full-time... Um, it's, a, it's a very short, sharp, five-week sort of period. Right. Um, you know, that we, we need to get this started. So it, it's about a, a semi-professional so they can continue to hold down their jobs but commit for a short period of time to this competition. They're already, those involved in the high-performance environments already committing, you know, outside of their work and study time. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a good progression. It, it, I w I'd love to see how it goes in, 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 you know, 10 years' time, but this is a great step forward. Yeah. 
we were chatting with Katie Sadler earlier and she was saying from a world rugby perspective one of their kind of pillars that they want for women's game is, is to commercially stand on its own two feet to get that money and is that uh, something at the at the national level that you you need and want to see as well? Yes, definitely. That's that's part of my brief is to how do we make the game grow but be sustainable and certainly, um, you know, I don't think our eyes were opened wider uh, through last year when, when the sport's under immense amount of financial pressure, but it, it's certainly still very fragile. So there is a real drive um, in this space and we know we have got some great partners already but there's also other opportunities outside the men's game where different partners um, are interested in supporting women's sport um, and there's different ways we can cut that um, and how we can connect back into our communities and, and, and drive the development in the communities as well so huge opportunity um, first we've got to get the foundations Right, so we're just quietly working on that. Um, what's right for our women is not always the same in the space for our men, but certainly um, the game itself is very is the same, it, it, same role, same uh, time, etc. But it's all the other bits around it that we're really um, conscious of and making sure it's really right for our women to thrive in. Because I guess that was one of the, the fears of COVID, right, that in a lot of sports that the women's teams and, and the women's element of the game was going to be the one to suffer when budgets were cut. Have you seen evidence that I know we had to change Farah Palmer Cup last year, going back to normal this year. Do, have you seen evidence of that, that the, perhaps the women have suffered a, a little more? Yeah, it did put a bit of a, a, a bit of a pause in, in where we were heading. We were projecting really well. So... Uh, and people had to make choices, and, um, and and it was pretty stressful and challenging time um, for everyone involved. Um, so yeah, they, I think we've pressed pause. I don't think we've stepped back too heavily in, in the performance space. But um, you know, our challenge now is is to actually play some international rugby. Um, that, that that's our big challenge at the moment. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because obviously one of those decisions made mm -hmm. was the postponement of, of the World Cup. So what can we expect for the Black Ferns this year? Year to get them into some sort of international competition uh, before the World Cup comes around again next year? Yeah, definitely hunting uh, test matches. Um, we have um, really pushed for the window, the international window, to, to be post Farah Palmer Cup. So the Farah Palmer Cup is earlier this year. So, you know, at mid September, we're looking for test matches. We're still working really hard with the Pacific four nations, so Australia, Canada and US, more than likely that is now going to be offshore. We would have loved that to be in New Zealand, but just, you know, finding space in MIQ for Canada and US is incredibly difficult. Um, and, and then we are having really uh, positive conversations with England and France, um, but again offshore. So I think we'll have some great opportunities to play. Uh, obviously, there's there's still question marks over, um, you know, what effect COVID has on travel and and being able to play, uh, whether we can get vaccinated. Um, yeah, a little disappointed that we we more than likely won't play in New Zealand this year, but. We just have to roll with that and, and, and work really hard to get some internationals up and running. And the girls are working pretty hard and behind the scenes. Um, certainly took a little pause when the World Cup was postponed. The head and the heart were mm. certainly at loggerheads. Um, um, but we, we've regrouped and, and we had some really positive conversations and, and, and camps um, as we build through to September, October this year. All right, Kate, I did this to Katie and I'm going to put you on the spot as well as we build up to Super Rugby Women Chiefs Blues. You need to pick, pick me a winner. I'm not going to tell you who Katie went. And I know you meant to be neutral and that, that you know all of the players <laughs> and you work with them all every day, but Blues Chiefs Saturday at Eden Park, who have you got? <laughs> um, oh, oh. Uh, who's this going to be due to? Um, <laughs> Everyone. To talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Chiefs will get over over the Blues and Golden Point. Oh, Golden Point picking it. All right, that's actually two for the Chiefs. Katie went Chiefs as well. So there we go. Kate, thank you so much for the work you're doing and for getting this game up. We're so excited for this to happen and what's ahead for the Black Ferns as well this year. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ricky.
That is Kate Sexton, the GM of, or the, excuse me, the head of women's uh, development for New Zealand rugby. We've had Katie Sadler, who is the GM of women's rugby for World Rugby. We've gone high level on our state of the women's game, but remember, it is all coming up at Eden Park. Kickoff 4:35 Saturday, May the first. It's here on Sky Sport One. You absolutely won't want to miss it. Stay tuned to the conversation. Get, find us wherever you get all your good po podcasts. Here, I'll use my words, and we'll get out of here. We'll see you next time.